keynote speaker uh, for this evening, Professor Mary P. Cor uh, Corcoran. Now, it's odd that they would ask a historian to introduce a sociologist, because normally in the academic ring, we're usually at fisticuffs. But as a social historian, I guess I've come halfway, so that may be more. Uh, but Mary is a professor of sociology at Maynooth University uh, in Ireland, graduate of Trinity College Dublin, uh, and Columbia University in New York, so a, a transatlantic uh, career academically. Um, her research interests lie primarily in fields of urban sociology, uh, public culture, and the sociology of migration, and I think that's a really good hook to what we discuss historically uh, at these conferences and uh, at, at others. Um, now, most recently, her work has focused on the role played by civil society uh, in urban agricultural activities. Um, she is the author and editor of numerous books, and I will not uh, list them, although they deserve to, uh, to be list articles and, and other anthologies. But for our purposes, in 2008, Mary was the recipient of a Fulbright, e uh, Fulbright EPA award uh, and was hosted by uh, Quinnipiac University and Ireland's Great Hunger Institute. So again, and yet another important connection. And her study focused on civil society and its responses to the challenges posed by food security in the New Haven area. And it's interesting that tonight among the audience members are people that Mary worked with when she was here uh, in the first semester of this academic year. And you're so very welcome uh, tonight to, to be with us uh, to share your appreciation of the work that, that Mary has done here in New Haven. Now she's also, uh, among her credits, a former Taoiseach's nominee to the National Economic and Social uh, Forum, uh, and uh, she's currently in her second term of office as a member of Maynooth's university governing body. Um, well, God bless her for that. <laughs> she's a member of the board of the Western Development Commission in Ireland, uh, and uh, the Child Development Initiative in South County Dublin, where she also chairs the local community development committee. How she found time to come here, I do not know. Um, but I also know that this was not to be the time when she was to be lecturing. In fact, she was to give her keynote lecture of a sort in November. Mm -hmm. Now, those of you from the New Haven area, listen, I live in Canada, and I know how rotten November was. Uh, and there was a major blizzard, uh, even by Canadian standards, here in Connecticut, which shut everything down, including Mary's lecture. Mm. And so um, she's very kindly come back to us <laughs> now. I was going to say, in, in, in greater climactic conditions, but today has been an exception to the rule. Uh, but we're delighted that she's here. Please. Welcome, Mary Corbin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. He actually stole my little line about, you know, being snowed out the last time and having had to do a major rain dance this morning to make sure that you'd all come along. Look, I mean, I don't have to say it. It is a huge privilege and also a pleasure uh, to be here today and to be able to share with you some of my learning from the period that I spent here last semester. And also to have an opportunity, I hope, to link my contemporaneous work on the food landscape with the incredible scholarship on the impact and legacy of the Great Irish Famine, which we have been exposed to over the last two days. And we still have one more wonderful, or two more days to go uh, tomorrow and Saturday. Um, and, and, and it's hard going because there's a lot of breaks for snacks and some fortification of the liquid kind. So you really do need to be quite resilient for this conference. <laughs> uh, before I get into the talk, I just want to say a few thank yous. Um, first of all, to thank the Fulbright Programme, uh, which uh, enabled me to come and spend some time here last year and to acknowledge uh, Fulbright's role in the research. Uh, obviously, first and foremost, to thank our wonderful professor, Christine Keneally, uh, who gave me the letter of invitation to Quinnipiac and to the Great Hunger, Ireland's Great Hunger Institute, and who was really a guiding light uh, for me uh, last semester. And, of course, uh, Christine's uh, 
assistant Anne-Marie, and then a lot of colleagues at Quinnipiac who really helped me out uh, just getting started and getting oriented to the area. I have to acknowledge my Airbnb super host, Dr. Laura Freebarn smith who provided with me with a home from home for three and a half wonderful months. And of course, as Mark already has done, stealing my thunder again, I am so emotional that some of the people who worked with me and who helped me and who inspired me last semester have come along to hear my few words today. So without further ado, I'll get started. Um, now, I did time this and I, I hope uh, I'll, I'll rush through if I uh, go. If I'm looking like I'm going to go to six, I'll stop. OK. So the first thing I want to talk about is the importance of food. Food is central in our everyday lives. And what I think is a lot of us take it for granted, it does, so it doesn't get the reflection that it deserves. Now, food has a material quality. It is both life-giving, but it's also its absence can be life-threatening. Food also has a symbolic quality. It's deeply implicated in our understandings of social class. So, you know, we're all familiar with posh food versus junk food, slow food versus fast food, organic food versus processed food. Those are all kind of uh, statements that we can read people's social class from where they lie on each of those continuums. It's implicated in status systems. There's a whole new set of people now who are flexitarian, pescatarian, vegetarian, veganarian, right? And these are all status statements about who I am in relation to the food I eat. Food is also, it's a measure of your cultural capital. You know, are you food literate? What's your knowledge of food provenance? Do you have any food production skills? Do you have taste? There's a whole new group in society now. We, we know all about the hipsters and everything. Uh, we also have the foodies. These are like a particular kind of tribe uh, in society. The cultural capital issue, that issue of provenance, taste, skill, uh, is most evidence in the success of TV programs, such as The Great British Bake Off, uh, you know, Anthony Burton and Nigella Lawson, The Taste, MasterChef, and so on. So right, there's a whole lot of cultural kind of implications to food. Food is a social process. It's mainly through the sharing of food that we come into communion with each other. Preparing, serving, consuming meals are about nurturing social bonds, reinforcing relationships, socializing children, engaging in reciprocity. Because none of us really like the guest that shows up without bringing something to the table. Food also gives us the opportunity to exercise our innate creativity and our capacity as human beings. But food is a deeply political matter. Disparities in terms of access to food are closely linked to social and economic vulnerabilities and are deeply consequential for people in terms of their health, their mortality and their morbidity rates, and even in terms of their ability to fully participate in society. And disparities arise, as we know, because of a consequence of the particular kind of institutional arrangements that are in place in the wider economy and polity. And talking about the links between environmental justice, social equity and public health, Rachel morello Frost, uh, who gave a talk at Yale last semester, she referred to, quote, the political economy of risk scapes. And I think that term could just as easily be used, uh, could be invoked in the context of the seemingly intractable problem of food hunger in the contemporary city. Because inequality creates food hunger, and that in turn creates health issues and participation issues, and those can really only be solved through a food justice approach. And it was very interesting this morning, uh, one of the speakers, Brendan Scott, was talking about famines in Ireland in the 17th century. And he quoted from a contemporary account of the time where he talked about the famine meant the utter undoing of people. Uh, and that followed from the fact you know, that they didn't have enough food to sustain them. And in a way, it is quite shocking that 250 years or more after that, I'm not, I'm not able to do the math in my head, after 1741, that people, uh, that, that we are still experiencing the utter undoing of people with the lack of food to sustain them. Okay, right, I do have my little clicker, yes. Right, now. This will be familiar to some of you here. 
Back in October, I had the opportunity to volunteer on a Saturday morning at a community garden uh, called Field of Greens in the Hill neighbourhood of New Haven. And apart from picking up some nasty mosquito bites, I also picked up tomatillos. For the first time in my life, I'd never seen one before. I was like a child at Christmas. So there was tons of tomatillos to be harvested in the garden, and I had to ask my host, Jamila Rashid, if she could explain this strange fruit to me. And I was completely blown away by the aesthetic jackets that these fruits wear, as you can see there. I mean, that's actually their little jacket that they come in. And uh, the awesome, if I say so myself, salsa verde that I made by baking the tomatillos and blending them with chili, garlic, and onions. So what did I do that morning? I got to work with the soil. I weeded and I harvested. I got to take home the fruit of my labor. And then I got to create a salsa that I was able to share with others. How many of us can readily have such an experience in the contemporary city? To a great extent, many of us have been dispossessed of this capacity to produce, to distribute, and to consume for ourselves within the context of our localities. And that is because food production, food distribution, and food consumption are organized on an industrial scale and almost wholly with a profit motive in mind. And this has consequences. It has led to overproduction, to homogenization, the rise of convenience foods that have had the impact of de-skilling uh, us and our capacity to make food for ourselves. And it has also created a global food market that has major implications for climate and ecology, even in something like food miles. Serious inequities have arisen in relation to food that mirrors the inequities in wider society. And for some sectors of the population, access and affordability of food, even in the richest countries of the global north, uh, is no longer available. And there are reports, the facts and faces food hardship in Hamden, that report which came out in 2019, the state of hunger in New Haven, the report that came out in 2018, both demonstrate uh, that this problem, the existence of food hunger. New Haven has a significant problem in this regard. Food insecurity, some of these reports have shown uh, to impact one third of adults in the city's lowest income neighborhoods. And Latinx communities are most likely to be affected by food insecurity, as are the unemployed and the underemployed. Just over 30% of New Haven residents participate in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program known as SNAP in 2015, right? So a third of residents actually qualify for those. And 56% of New Haven children live in households that receive that supplementary nutrition program. Not surprisingly, those who are food insecure are more likely than the average in the population to report health problems. Moreover, uh, so those are just some of the points that I've made there. Uh, moreover, United Way's research on what they call the Alice households, asset limited, income constrained, employed people. People who are working one job, people who are working two jobs. Uh, these are households which dem uh, the working poor uh, and the uh, research by um, uh, United Way demonstrates that 30% of Connecticut households have earnings above the federal poverty level but below a basic cost of living. And they qualify then as these kind of uh, Families, which can be called Alice. Oops, sorry. Yes. And to sort of describe that, uh, one of the respondents that I interviewed in the course of this research just sort of explained it in real language to me. Folks are not getting their basic needs met. And really, food is kind of the hidden one that goes first. Um, you know, a person has got to pay my mortgage, my cell phone. I'll put money away for that. I'll put a bit of money there for my kids' needs. What can I cut? I can cut my food budget. We just won't eat as much food this week. And, and this respondent saying, I feel like that is what is happening with our Alice folk. So that, that's what it's like to not be able to make ends meet and to have to uh, shortchange yourself on food. Um, an Italian uh, sociologist who's actually based in Britain, uh, Chiara Tornaghi, has observed that the working poor, the homeless, the dispossessed, are hungry and unable to provide for themselves. 
Food knowledge, food skills and food production have been largely removed as a fundamental component of social reproduction from human daily life. And it's not only that, I think that has also been exacerbated by a dispossession from the land itself. And that was characterised in a recently published uh, book in Britain called The New Enclosure, The Appropriation of Public Land in Britain. And the author, Brett Christopher, describes that as a distancing of people, quote, economically, socially and politically from the land they inhabit. Now, um, yeah, okay, no, I don't want to go into that one yet. Right, so what is my research focus? Well, in a sense, what I was trying to do really was move from sort of thinking about these global issues of food down to the local level. And we do know almost all countries are connected in some way into a kind of global food industry. But there has been a bit of pushback against that. In recent years, there's been a critique coming out of academia, coming out of journalism, coming out of grassroots uh, movements, calling the global food industry to account. We also know that in response to those riskscapes, um, that states and international bodies have had to assume a role in monitoring and policing food provenance, food safety and food standards. Moreover, states are increasingly being put under pressure um, by their constituencies to develop policies and technologies that can address environmental challenges that are becoming ever more challenging. And we really saw that in Europe a couple of weeks ago when there was a kind of a green sweep across Europe where many countries voted Green Party people into the European Parliament specifically to try and take on those environmental challenges and to force the European Union to move ahead. But we also have to recognise that these challenges are occurring at a time when the state itself, both the US and indeed in many European countries, has adopted marketization strategies to service uh, provision, endeavouring to reduce state spending and favouring an individualised approach rather than a socialised approach to the provision of goods to populations. So against this backdrop of, you know, kind of a need for more state involvement, but at the same time a kind of a pulling back of the state, my research interest focused on the potential role of civil society groups, which many people in America call the not-for-profit sector, but it kind of means not-for-profits, not voluntary kind of groups. Uh, and really to look at to what extent those groups can affect change. So specifically in the context of New Haven, I'm in, I was interested in how groups and organizations that were committed to environmentally sustainable ways of living, committed to urban food cultivation, committed to the concept of food justice, to what extent they are able to affect change at grassroots level and try to develop an alternative vision of the urban food landscape. So what I do, I talked to 20, I, I interviewed 28 people involved in a range of different initiatives, um, most of them but not all focused on food, and that included academics, practitioners, uh, municipality personnel, directors of organisations, activists and students. I also visited or volunteered at a range of different gardens, at the Yale Farm Project in the uh, downtown evening soup kitchen, a food pantry, and I attended a lot of meetings of the Food Policy Council and the Food Access Working Group, which all gave me opportunities to meet with some, as I've said at the start, incredible and totally inspiring people. Okay, so that's kind of the backdrop, so I'll just get into the meat of the paper now. Terrible pun, apologies. Um, so the structure of the paper, I'm really just going to talk about four things. So, and, and what this is, I'm, I'm a qualitative sociologist. I interview people, I transcribe my interviews, I read the data over and over, and I try to see what themes are coming out here. What are people saying that's really striking and that more than one person is saying the same thing? So this is really a first go at it, and I, you know, I would appreciate if you would bear with me because I will have to... You know, I mean, I, I'll have to sift through this data a lot of times to, to really mine it to its full extent. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about, yeah, what I have, I've come up with a new word. You know, it's always important to kind of develop your own language in academia so you can obfuscate a bit. Uh, polycivicism. I, I, I can actually justify it, I think. Uh, civil society and food activism in New Haven. I need to talk about the city and the university because they came up a lot in interviews and you know, we need to reflect on how civil society connects with both of those. 
And then a third kind of theme that came out was the sort of systemic challenges that people see that, you know, really are, are moving way beyond the issue of just trying to feed people, but to think about what are the structural kind of challenges that we need to overcome if we want to transform. And then I hopefully will have the time to connect back with extractive economies by linking my work to the famine, the Irish famine. Okay, so uh, polycivicism. Um, in 1961, Robert Dahl published a classic study called Who Governs Democracy and Power in an American City, which explored political power dynamics in New Haven. Dahl pointed out that New Haven then was in many respects typical of other cities in the United States. So that was 1961. And it's kind of interesting because a number of respondents uh, in interviews said to me, oh, by the way, New Haven is, you know, the most representative uh, city in the United States. And this comes from the work of Mark Abraham of Data Haven, who says the city is the most representative urban area in the nation if you look at it demographically. In other words, it's more similar to the US average than any other city in America. So for that reason, we can say it's probably a good place to look at what's going on and perhaps to think about how we might model policies and programs. Okay. So Dahl's book, Who Governs, he, you know, illuminated the evolution of City Hall and the relationship between elected officials and their voters across time. So he, he did quite a historical work and brought it up to date. What's almost totally missing from the book, which I'm sure some of you have read, because it was always a classic in political science, uh, even when I was doing my um, uh, undergraduate degree. So what's missing in the book, apart from the total under-theorization of gender, of race and of ethnicity is any sense of a civil society sector in New Haven, of any kind of group of people mediating between, between what Dahl calls homo civisus, or civicus, which is the disengaged voter who simply just, you know, puts a mark on a ballot every few years, and homo politicus, who is the elected politician and whose main function is to manage and deploy resources. So that was the first thing that struck me when I read the book. There was no civil society, or if there was, it certainly wasn't on the radar of this eminent political scientist. So to be fair to Dahl, the flowering of civil society is generally traced, certainly in the Anglo-American con uh, context, to the 1970s. And uh, as a, a recent book on civil society uh, has said, in the 1970s, groups, volunteer groups, uh, civil society groups were inspired by a critical commitment, not just to demonstrating alternative ways of delivering services, but to open up a pathway to a much more radical democratic public life. Now, it's true, what I think is that, so that's where my term polycivicism, I think that, you know, what Dahl missed was that there's a kind of a space in between the citizen and the politician, which is actually a kind of a civic space, but it is quite politicized because there's actors acting there on behalf of the voters and in a way mediating to the politicians. So New Haven today, I think, is distinguished by its polycivicism because that's evidence in the fact that again from my interviewees, between 800 and 1,000 non-profit groups operate in this city. New Haven has about 130,000 people, and Cork City, it's about the size of Cork, which has 125,000 people, just to give you some scale. So 1,000 uh, non-profit voluntary organizations is really a big deal in a city of this size. Now, obviously, I'm just interested in the ones in the food area. But in the specific context of the food landscape, the sector, I think, has two functions. It acts as a loose network of interconnected agents that keep the issue of food live in New Haven. And secondly, it performs a crucial advocacy and mediation role, linking the population with the municipality and also with the state of Connecticut. So there is an important role for uh, polycivicism. Okay. Um, now, this is just a kind of a summary thing, and I'm, I'm not really going to delay on it. You know, what I've said is there's a lot of activity here, and it ranges across a lot of different functions, from, uh, you know, delivering meals to vulnerable populations, to actually thinking about creating a self-determining local food system and everything in between. So what I tried to do was just categorize them, which I'm not sure if this is legible. It's not really that important if it isn't. I categorize them as primarily practical in orientation, or pedagogical, 
are eco-entrepreneurial are political in, or, uh, in orientation. And of course, those are just tendencies. Some organizations are multifunctional, so they would actually fit um, across uh, uh, the whole of that. So I've listed here some of them. It's not gonna mean very much to Irish people, but maybe the local people will be able to pick me up on this after. But in the practical, you're really talking about people who are doing soup kitchens, who are delivering food to people who are in their homes, who are, you know, um, offering people the opportunity to buy from a farmer's market. In the pedagogical, there's a number, there's a, a particular high school, there's a daycare center that I visited where nature, understanding of food, of climate change is all integrated into the curriculum. Uh, there's a Yale Farm program, and the Leon the Sister Sisters project has, you know, a, a kind of an, an outreach program on climate change. The eco-entrepreneurial are where people get opportunities maybe to work in these particular fields. So community-supported agriculture, where you're actually buying from local farmers and therefore contributing to the economy and keeping those farmers in business. Um, there are a number of different kind of incubator funds. Uh, the land trust actually uh, encouraging young students by giving them kind of internships, paid uh, entrepreneur, uh, paid uh, stipends for them to engage in entrepreneurial activities in the community gardens in the region. And then here you have political and capacity building, which are groups like Witnesses to Hunger, the CT Core Food Justice Program, and also the Citizens Campaign for the Environment, which is a Connecticut-wide group, but is based in Hamden and does quite a lot of work in that area. Now, you're probably all going, Jesus, you know, how many slides and how much material? So now I have some nice photographs. <laughs> right, so this is just a little break. Uh, so this is just um, photographs of the, the van from the soup kitchen and I took that photograph when I worked in the kitchen chopping vegetables with the most horrendous hairnet on my head. I actually kept the hairnet because it just looks like a little sort of furry creature. Um, but we all had to wear them when we were chopping the vegetables. Um, this is a photograph of New Haven Farms. A lot of you are very familiar with it and you can see the way they actually advertise the fact that they will accept uh, senior checks or you know people who um, have... Uh, it, who basically qualify for um, assistance can use that in order to buy pro fresh produce from the farm. They also want, run a wonderful diabetes program where there is kind of social prescription of fresh vegetables and they try to you know, empower people to take some control over their diet and introduce fresh produce into it. City Seed has its beautiful market on the green. Uh, I think on Wednesdays and Saturdays. These are two lovely community gardens and I'm delighted that Mary Ann Morin is here because she brought me on this whistle top tour of nine community gardens in the West uh, Haven, Fair Haven, sorry, sorry, Fair Haven neighborhood. And this one I particularly love because it's in the Clinton Avenue School, Clinton Street School, where there are, um, there's food growing going on inside the school gate but that became so popular that they actually created some beds outside so that people passing could actually uh, help out and also take some of the produce. So it's really nice breaking down that barrier between the school and the public space outside it and also the lovely uh, growing that goes on outside the library there. The school, the Common Ground School, a charter school that has an embedded agricultural nature program um, where they're really trying to train uh, young people to really understand uh, agroecology and the need for an agroecological approach uh, to the landscape. They do, they have fabulous uh, farm, uh, hands-on activities and lots of information. This is a, a more traditional allotment in Edgerton Gardens, but even there, everybody who has a single allotment for themselves, they have to do two hours voluntary work, socialized work for the, uh, the allotments as a whole every week. And that's just some of the produce we got in the uh, field of dreams. Aren't they fabulous? Yeah, we couldn't believe it. The kids were amazed. And that is some of the tomatoes that I, we had to sort at the Yale uh, farm when I was volunteering there. And this is uh, Lifeboat Gardens, the, the local bioregional bio group who have a beautiful demonstration farm at their space and say food, not lawns. Okay. Right, um, so that's the end of the pictures. So it's back to the text now for a while. 
Um, okay, so what, what do all these organizations, like they're all quite varied, they do different things and so on. But the one thing they have in common is that they are trying to foster social inclusion, health and well-being, and they're really trying to foster the values of environmental stewardship, as I mentioned, agroecological uh, sustainability, sustainability in the city more generally. Now, I would argue that these uh, civil society groups are grounded in the American communitarian tradition, which emphasizes, and this is a quote from Etzioni, who is the person who's written a lot about this, it emphasizes interactive and reinforcing relationships between groups of individuals who have a clear commitment to a particular set of values, norms and meaning. So I'm saying is that, the, you know, underpinning those four different groups of, of people all doing stuff is this shared ethos, a communitarian ethos that we believe in a set of values and we're doing what we can as a group of individuals to actually attain those. Um, it's interesting that the people who manage uh, and lead in the sector really often share quite a common trajectory. So they have things like a lifetime history of commitment to social justice that's evidenced in a track record of volunteering. Um, a lot of them have done further education and upskilling in their chosen field. Some, uh, and, and most of them have experience of working in the nonprofit sector. So the same type of person, if you like, is attracted uh, to this work. And some of them spoke about uh, crystallizing moments. Okay, there's quite a lot of text there. I'll just very quickly read it. Uh, one informant said, well, I was always interested in peasant revolutions, which were always about who had power and who controlled land. So I was asking questions about power. I was also asking questions about what people were eating and looking at how they ate and their relation to the land. And that made food and uh, something I love to do with my family, food as a cultural pursuit, to move on to food as an intellectual pursuit. And I wanted to know about, you know, why are people eating? What are they eating? And how, come, uh, how, how did that come to be? And another mentioned how, having taken a food justice course, uh, that that had really opened their eyes to systemic oppression within the food system, and that then became a motivating factor for their work. A lot of the... Uh, many of the graduates of the master's program at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental uh, Science uh, show up in this sector. And, you know, they uh, are very much uh, the leaders and managers. In a way, they constitute a relatively bounded group of people who are quite well interconnected and interlinked because they either know each other from work settings or from education settings prior to their appointments. Uh, okay. Every, uh, as one respondent observed, everybody knows everyone and everyone has worked for everyone. So you got to be very careful and not burn your bridges in this town. You got to know when you're going to need someone else, right? So that was uh, how someone characterized it. Another respondent suggested that the high level of integration is a function of the relatively modest size of the city and the relatively high level of civic engagement in New Haven. So this respondent said, well, I think the density of connections within the civil society sector feels much more possible because of the scale of the city of New Haven. It's large enough to have a carrying capacity of nonprofit organizations where there's a lot of actors who care about the same issues, that communitarian ethos again, but it is small enough that you can look at the city as a scale and wrap your arms around that and know each other. And I actually think that's a lovely image and really captures uh, what I certainly experienced in observing and working in that sector last semester. Now, Kirsten Reynolds, who has written a book uh, called Beyond the Kale, it's a brilliant title for a book, it's about a... Uh, it's about urban agriculture and social justice in New York City. I, I wish I'd got that title. Uh, has noted that throughout the US, policy making that deals with food and agriculture is relatively new for municipal governments. And that presents its own challenges in terms of garnering any kind of financial or other supports uh, needed. So in a sense, what you get is that the civil society sector has to carry this issue because really, although you know, there is some infrastructure within the city council, it's not enough. And there is this kind of sense in which, you know, cities and states have, have not fully engaged, if you like, with this issue. So insofar as there's any kind of driver uh, of innovation and change, it comes from the civil society sector, which is dependent for survival, of course, on volunteerism and raising funds from government, individuals, philanthropic and corporate donations. 
So one uh, person uh, who's active in the sector said a lot of the work done uh, by grassroots movements depends on people donating and volunteering. We don't expect the municipality to act. The approach we take on the issue is from below. Now, these organizations spend a lot of their time grant writing, advocating, and developing story narratives to capture the imagination of donors. And one respondent characterized this organization model as a begging economy. Now, and, and I think, you know, that's quite a political charge to make that, you know, all these people who have amazing capital, cultural capital, and have so much innovation and so much to give, spend a lot of their time just trying to raise the money to stay in existence. Invariably, because of the size of the sector and the relatively limited number of donors, there can be competition between organizations for funds. Organizations also run the risk of mission creep in their efforts to raise funds. And Reynolds found that in New York as well. And of course, when funding is so contingent, uh, it militates against long-term or joined up strategic thinking in the sector. Everyone's trying to stay going for the next year. Some of the respondents uh, did reflect on that. And in fact, a number of people talked about uh, you know, fostering greater collaboration and eliminating the potential for duplication and achieving some kind of consolidation, uh, achieving some uh, economies of scale. So these are just a couple of quotes from people. You know, I think we shouldn't have so many nonprofits. We should join and be more effective. Uh, we have had many conversations over the years about consolidation. How should we support one another? Are there back office functions we can share? Is there programmatic redundancy? I think most of the innovation going forward will be consolidation and more assistance from the local and state government in terms of leadership. Uh, which really brings us to the issue of the city uh, and the role of the city in advancing food policy and food justice in New Haven. So New Haven, at least on paper, has a track record in terms of its stated committed to a commitment to advancing a sustainable and socially just urban food system. Uh, it has a food policy council made up of 12 members appointed by the mayor and board of aldermen who represent various parts of the local food system. And members of the public are very welcome to attend those meetings. The first food policy council met in 2007 and it addresses issues of concern. Uh, in the local and regional food system, it developed a food action plan back in 2013. Um, there's a subgroup of the Food Policy Council. Sorry, I should say there are now about 200, uh, slightly more than 200 uh, Food Policy Councils across the United States. And it's fair to say that New Haven was really at the forefront in that. Uh, there's also the Food Access Working Group, a subcommittee of the Policy Council that brings a range of stakeholders from across the city together to focus specifically on the issue of food access and develop joined up work programs. Now, so it's in those two fora, the Food Policy Council and the Food Action, uh, Access Working Group, that the, all the different groups come together. And those regular meetings are really important. They allow for information sharing, exchanges of views. In theory, they allow for forward planning, but I think a lot of the time it's contingency planning. Those involved represent really a, quite a broad cross-section of New Haven residents in terms of gender, generation, race, class, and ethnicity. That was my observation. I'm not sure if, that, if everybody would agree with me. There's also a broad range of views expressed at these meetings, reflecting the different roles, the different passions, and the different missions of the participating organizations. Um, New Haven in 2016 was amongst just 20 similar uh, municipalities that appointed a food policy director um, to really be, if you like, the champion for building, improving and sustaining a citywide effort on food security. The post was filled for a while and then it was empty for a while and at the time I was doing my research, a wonderful new food policy director had just been appointed and I understand from a brief chat with her outside that things are definitely moving along nicely, which is great to hear. Okay, the city um, then uh, has published in January 2018 a climate and sustainability framework, uh, which is a very glossy, very attractive document and which incorporates four policy goals on food. So decreasing food waste, improving access to healthy food, promoting the consumption of local food and engaging the public, which, you know, to a great degree are all uh, ambitions that are underway through the act actions of the civil society sector. However, respondents were extremely equivocal about whether and how 
a framework document like that can be implemented given three main challenges that come from the city. Money, capacity, and mission drift. So the issue of the fiscal weakness of the municipality was raised in interviews regularly at the meetings, uh, in interviews and regularly at the meetings of the Food Policy Council and the Food Access Working Group. Budgets are tight and there have been a lot of cuts in recent years. So, I mean, there's just a couple of samples of what people said. You know, the city is starving for a source of revenue and you can only do it through taxation. Um, the implications of this is that the various policy directorates are not resourced enough with budgets and personnel to actually do the implementation of these fabulous policies that have been derived. So the concept of a food policy directorship exists, but funds haven't so far, at least to my knowledge, been forthcoming to properly resource the unit or to publicly uh, address you know, the funding issue. And, you know, you can see there uh, where somebody says, you know, well, there is a framework plan and they're trying to move on it, but the folks who are actually orchestrating it are in one department and they have a lot to do in their day job as well. So there just isn't enough staff uh, to work on these issues. And of course, you know, that means then that, you know, that the framework document excites people, there's a plan, let's buy into this, and then nothing happens. And, you know, another... Um, uh, respondent said, you know, somebody somewhere, an office, an institution, a private organization, a non-profit, somebody has to make it happen because it's not going to happen from the city. So there's really quite a strong sense in which, uh, you know, things are, are difficult uh, in terms of getting the city to act. Now, these issues are not, of course, unique to New Haven or even to North America, and it certainly was not always thus. So, you know, we know that the municipality in New Haven is under pressure financially, um, but that really is quite starkly different to the situation back in the 1950s when Dahl was writing a, his book uh, about who governs in uh, the, the American city. Because then, as we know, because we can see it when we can't see the sea anymore because of the highway, is, uh, you know, the burghers of the city acted very boldly and decisively to implement an urban renewal plan. Dahl observes that to pass from ideal to reality, every proposal requires an expenditure of critical resources, money, time, energy, attention, skill, and political support. And at that time, back in the 1950s, the mayor, supported by a dedicated development administrator, secured the necessary support, funds, and approval from others to make a major urban renewal plan happen. Um, so what we know is that in the absence of those critical resources, bold ambitions like a climate uh, uh, framework uh, are, are much less likely to succeed, or like you know, a proper sort of food system for New Haven are likely to not succeed. Okay, now I need to speed up a little bit to get to the end here because... Oh, I started at 10 past five, so I just... Do I get to go to six anyway? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So the third issue was mission drift. And, you know, this came up again, sort of the, the reluctance really to take on the issue of food, to see food and hunger as a political kind of issue. And, you know, the whole idea of trying to champion the right to food. So people who are on the very political side want to see that come to the fore. But really, instead, the city has, to some extent, divested itself uh, from taking responsibility for food insecurity and shifted that to the civil society sector. So what we know is that the number of food banks in, uh, have increased dramatically over the, in the United States, and some respondents see that as a failure of the state. So, um, you know, you can see the onus being shifted from government to people. Then people do like this charity model, mo a model which goes back to the dignity part. It doesn't solve anything. It's a hole in a big tank of water and you're putting a piece of gum in there and hoping for the best. Um, Emergency Food Act is a piece that gets a lot of attention and, you know, the thing is, it isn't a big part of the conversations around grassroots justice. The way the emergency food industry operates, it doesn't leave room for self-determination or even addressing system issues about why people are hungry in the first place. And we heard a wonderful paper earlier uh, talking about famine in Ireland in 1741, where a civil society group and uh, a voluntary organization organized to feed the starving people, but they had an analysis and they were saying it isn't enough 
to feed people, we've fi got to figure out a way of preventing this happening. So the same kind of issue 250 years ago people were grappling with. How do we move from just giving people food to sustain them to actually figuring out, you know, why are they hungry in the first place and how can we actually prevent this? Okay. Um, Right, so I can't talk without mentioning Yale, uh, as one of the respondents call it, the elephant in the room. So going back to uh, Dahl's book, Who Governs, he noted the importance of Yale in the city and the university, and, and of course it does continue to be a power broker in the city. But the relationship with Yale has evolved very much over decades. So the university has very clearly extended its efforts to connect with the municipality and with civil society in New Haven to contribute to the sustainability agenda. So there's a number of ways in which it does that. I've already mentioned that a lot of people who graduated from Yale actually stay in the city, remain actively involved in their communities, doing volunteering or paid work or combinations of both. And those Yale graduates are quite well affiliated with each other, and one actually uh, referred to it as a kind of Yale intelligentsia. And that's a great kind of piece of capital, of human capital, to have available. At a corporate level, the university lends its resources to the civil society sector. So, for example, the Yale School of Public Health, the Yale School of Management, uh, will provide you know, research assistance, will sort of uh, lend their students to do pieces of research for different organizations. The Yale Farm Program uh, also has a Food Fellow pro, uh, Program, which will help uh, you know, provide interns over the summer to New Haven-based organizations. And, and its farm is open to the public and so on. Uh, the Yale Sustainability Office is involved with the Go New Haven Go, and it also contributed to developing the climate uh, framework of the city. And actually, there's a, there's a lot of other initiatives. I don't have the time to go into them. So there is that sort of, we are extending ourselves to the community. We are providing you know, our capital really in the, whoops, in the form of human capital. Now, writing back in 1961, Dahl observed that, quote, although the university is one of the largest property owners in the city, it also happens to be far and away the largest owner of tax-free property. And this, he believed, made Yale officials sensitive to expressions of local hostility and fearful of becoming embroiled in disputes with locals. So I would say that that largely holds true today. Although Yale has worked hard through its program to win over hearts and minds, there is unease about the extent to which Yale is seen as a, quote, hoarder of land and capital and is being tied to, quote, the colonization of the city. So lots of people... Uh, sorry, yes, I have them there, you know, made points about uh, Yale not paying taxes, you know, that the, if the city's going to survive, we've got to talk about this and we've got to see if there's a way of moving uh, Ye Yale forward. Um, okay, so I want to come on to the last section of the paper, really, which is talk about uh, systemic, systemic challenges. So a lot of people in sociology have written about sort of building utopias, right? And, and one of them, the, the late Eric Olin Wright, uh, was a very famous American sociologist, talked about how we could repurpose space in a long-term process of transformation that could really sort of ameliorate the effects of capitalism. And he's not the first person, and I don't imagine he'll be the last person to talk about that, but there have been examples of people trying to come together, particularly in a post-austerity Europe, uh, people coming together to collectively respond to provision in areas of housing and food uh, and healthcare. And, you know, trying to maybe do things like reframing land in the city as communal rather than private space. And that can be very transformative for the people involved because it allows us to work together in new ways, right? If you're not sort of always reliant on private land, if there is space and land available for communal activities, it allows you to begin to experiment. And uh, the Italian sociologist I mentioned earlier, uh, Chiara Tornighi, she argues for a politics of engagement, capability and empowerment that you know, extends citizens' control over their lives in the city. And this is of particular relevance, I think, to people of colour in the city whose lives have been deeply impacted by what Reynolds has described as underlying racial and class dynamics that perpetuate structural inequity. So 
quite a number of the uh, respondents really talked a lot about the kind of food apartheid and the fact that when you look at the food, the data on food hunger and so on, it is primarily people of colour who suffer in that way. And so um, I think, you know, a number of the people I interviewed are very aware of the systemic inequities, historical and contemporary, that structure their lives. And they see food justice as one area where it's possible to maybe move beyond that food apartheid and begin to change. Um, and, you know, some of them mentioned the fact that a lot of the organizations in the sector so, you know, have, do, uh, have predominantly been uh, white-led organizations. And it's really time for uh, people of color who are most affected by this issue to have the opportunity to create you know, forms of leadership where they're the ones who are actually leading the organizations. And of course, there's a lot of barriers and difficulties with that. One group that has taken on this issue is, of course, the Witnesses to Hunger group, uh, which bears witness through everyday uh, it bears witness to their everyday lived experience of hunger and deprivation by simply telling their stories and presenting visual and verbal testimonies to legislators at conferences and so on. And, and a couple of those wonderful witnesses to hunger are in the room, uh, and I must say they're extremely inspiring because, you know, somebody was mentioning earlier the importance of narratives and the importance of telling stories and understanding stories historically. And I think these narratives have a huge role to play in helping to shift our understanding of what the issue of food hunger is really about. Uh, there's also uh, organizations, um, I don't know if I have that, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, organizations such as uh, CT Core, which has actually, you know, really thought about these issues and produced a kind of racial justice f platform as well as a food justice guide. And that organization really, I mean, if you wanted to sum it up, what they're trying to do is understand, they, they want to provide an analysis that is grounded in the past, that is focused on organizing in the present with a view to transforming in the future. So, you know, let's build on our past experience, let's organize now, and let's look to the future and try to be uh, transformative. Um, okay, so th there's a, and it's a very deeply political way of thinking about the food landscape and echoes the call by Karen Washington, the New York City food activist, that people must have access to opportunity, capital, and land in order to take control of their own narrative. Now, land, and this is something kind of surprising, but it came out as a theme in the data that land in particular is important because we know that its value, uh, you know, dictates the cost of development, the price of housing, the fiscal base. Mostly land tenure for growing in the city is contingent. Short-term leases and tenancies uh, ensure that the value of land can be cashed in for development value once the market changes. So in many cities, there isn't enough land available and that that is available might be poisoned by toxins. So it's not necessarily useful for cultivation. So a lot of people um, that I talked to spoke about land as being a particular resource that's in very short supply and the importance of um, connecting uh, to land and how difficult it is now for people. You know, people don't come from the land anymore, young people who want to farm, but they don't come from the background and the barriers to entry are so high. And those barriers are particularly high if you're black or Latino or Amer uh, Native American. So, and this other one says, you know, looking at the work of folks currently and even some of the aspirations of our black ancestors and indigenous ancestors wanting to reconnect with the land. You can trace the roots of systemic oppression, but also there is a source of healing and the connection to the land, how we relate to it and to each other as stewards of the land and the environment. And if we can get that right, the system we build will be in that vein. And I must say, I find that sort of thinking extremely clarifying and also extremely political. Okay, I'm getting somewhere towards the end, you'll be happy to hear. Um, okay, I kind of banked on an hour, so I, only, I started at 10 past five, right. Okay, so just very briefly, w one way of kind of trying to pull this together, I, I try to create this idea of, you know, a, a, a continuum, which comes from, again, from my colleague Tornagy and Sir Toma. And, you know, they're talking about sort of that there's a kind of a range of activities you can engage in to try and change up the system. Some of those are simply kind of disruptive. You know, they're just 
change in the kind of everyday a little bit. So maybe reclaiming vacant plots and you know, creating community gardens or creating an urban farm. And those sort of things, you know, they're kind of interrupting the everyday life. Like it's funny to see vegetables growing in a city, right? It's unusual. It, it's not part of the, the general narrative of a city. And then you can move you know, through into kind of more focused awareness raising and education where you're kind of beginning to call out the status quo by getting people to think about potential solidarities, for example, between consumers and farmers. So, you know, supporting a community farm means that you're actually keeping the farmer in business as well as eating healthier food. Or, you know, uh, having your waste... Uh, uh, collected and paying for that service, then it's creating a good that can be reused within the system. So, you know, creating relationships that are moving things on a little. And finally, you can end up being very political, really politicizing the food agenda by thinking about transformational movements that are organizing to address and to call out the structural aspects of that racialized state. And that would be groups like Witnesses to Hunger are the core that I already spoke about. Okay, I wanted just in the last couple of minutes to try to relate this back a little bit to the Irish famine. And uh, I've called this beyond the extractive economy because in a way, you know, what we have tried to do in Ireland and, you know, achieve to some degree was to move beyond being a colonial outpost of Britain and being used as an extractive economy then. And what some of the people in the civil society groups in New Haven want to do is to move beyond extractive economies and create a much more transformed and sustainable agenda. In April 2019, the Hamden Food Security Task Force presented its report on food hardship at Ireland's Great Hunger Museum. And the local reporter who reported it in the New Haven Independent, he said, hunger is not a distant problem, but rather a harsh reality for many Hamden residents. The story of the Irish famine is an important reminder of the terrible consequences that flow from the pursuit of an economic model based on extraction. And as many of you know, in the 19th century, the Irish famine resulted from over-reliance on a single crop, an outcome of the particular political economy of colonial rule that prevailed at the time. And the British state largely uh, refused to provide a programme of aid to the Irish peasantry. Um, with some notable uh, exceptions, but opted instead to let market forces prevail. Now, the colonisation of Ireland involved the extraction or exploitation of raw materials and native peoples in pursuit of a profit motive. And obviously, most of you in the room are familiar with Christine Keneally's path-breaking work on the Irish famine. And when Christine was studying for her PhD in Trinity College, she was friends with a colleague of mine, Eamon Slater, a sociologist. And Eamon has written about the way in which the Irish people uh, cultivating land as tenants in the mid-19th century were systematically and intentionally impoverished through a system of rent increases, right, putting up the cost of rent, and through a system of soil depletion, of not nurturing the soil, no investment in agriculture by the landlords who were just concerned with making a profit. The rental income a renter class, was the main driver of their accumulation. So they weren't interested in the people, just in extraction. So that extractive approach is the very opposite of an agroecology approach to land. So an agroecology approach sees agricultural areas as ecosystems and is concerned with the ecological impact of agricultural practices. But as peasant production was overtaken by agriculture organized on capitalist principles, eviction and forced emigration followed in post-famine Ireland. And Slater, in writing about this, describes it as a process of dispossession of the people and a consolidation of holdings, property or land rights. So those are the two motifs that he comes out of looking at the Irish famine with. Dispossession and a consolidation of land rights. And I think that those two motifs, which are really about you know, a market-driven approach to food production and consumption and that dispossession from nature and soil and the land, they resonate down the centuries and they're evidenced today in New Haven and also in Hamden. 
So the food landscape in the city is not simply a recreational, environmental or ecological intervention in space. It's a political process and it's a social process that does have the potential to challenge existing ways of doing things on the one hand and contribute to nurturing inclusive and vibrant spaces and practices in the contemporary city on the other hand. And as such, I believe that a civil society sector that tries to connect food growing, consumption, distribution within the contours of a socially just and racially equitable framework, it has a major role to play in advancing a sustainable vision of the contemporary city. Thank you very much. Thank you.